I get up every morning at least by five, have a couple hours of quiet time, uh, reflect about what it is that is important. Before you get on with the business of the day? Before I go swimming. <laughs> <laughs> and then the business of the day. But uh, what do you think we can do, those of us who are purveyors of this television medium? What can we do to encourage people to have more quiet in their lives, to more silence? Real revelation comes through silence. But do, have you ever known anybody who was really satisfied or happy who had never made a difference in somebody else's life? No, no. Well, I've always hoped that we'd be able to say to children that they matter, that they count, and that there was something of value that resides within them. You know, I have a little plaque beside my chair upstairs in the office that says, what is essential is invisible to the eye. That may sound like something strange for somebody who works in television, but the older I get, the more important I know that is. Because what we see is rarely what is essential. What's behind your face is what's essential. I don't care how many, even if it's just one. Uh, we're, we get so wrapped up in numbers in our society. And the most important thing is that we're able to be one to one, you and I, with each other at the moment. If we can be present to the moment with the person that we happen to be with at the moment, that's what's important. Uh, well, you can't see my, uh, my spiritual life uh, unless you, unless you ask me about it. You, uh, you don't see uh, my family life, unless you ask me about it. I mean, the, it seems to me, Charlie, that the things that are center stage are rarely the things that are the most important. It's usually what happens over in the wings. How to, uh, how to know that it's all right to say what comes to your mind right away. Jesus said to the people around him, please let the little children come up here. I want to learn from them. He may not have said those words, but I think that's what he meant. I, I want to be involved with these, these innocent people who make up the kingdom of heaven. Well, I know that when I walk out of the studio someday and there is a child who has Down syndrome, right. for instance, and that child comes up and gives me a hug, uh, I know that that's the field that I want to be growing in because I see that people who, who are not the fancy people in this world are the ones who seem to nourish my soul. And I want to learn how to be the best receiver that I can ever be because I think graceful receiving is one of the most wonderful gifts we can give anybody. If we receive what somebody gives us in a graceful way, We've given that person, I think, a wonderful gift. I think she liked the response that she got. And I remember somebody saying to me that she made $35,000 a week. And in 1951, well, it's an enormous salary any time, but in 1951, can you imagine? Uh, I, 
All I know is that I was constantly astounded by her voice. And it was an absolutely natural uh, organ. I mean, it, it, that instrument was so pure. It was a glorious voice. Now, I don't know whether she was comfortable in the medium or not. She, she sure knew where to go and, and what to do. Well, I, I've often said that uh, he was a person who, I, I said to him one time, Mr. Hayes, what do you think of when you look at that camera and know that there are thousands of people watching you? And he said, Freddie, I think of one little buckaroo. And you know, that must have gone straight to my heart because when I look at the camera, I think of one person not any specific person, but one person. It's very, very personal, this medium. Well, if you have a, a that's one of the reasons I thought that, that for education it would be so fabulous. Because if you have someone on television in a classroom, it looks like that person is looking at each student individually. A, a live teacher can't do that. A live teacher can do other things, though. You know, uh, there is, you'll never find me saying that any machine is better than a person. In fact, that is underlined constantly in the neighborhood. Uh, for the first time, I showed a computer on a tape that we did the other day for the neighborhood. And I was insistent that I would say, there are lots of fun things that go on here, you know. But no machine can take the place of a person. This machine cannot give you a hug. It might be able to spell H-U-G, but it can't give you one. Uh, well, that's obvious. But you know it might not be obvious to children. And so consequently, I think it's important to uh, let them know how I feel. How do you feel about um, you know, some shows today, uh, like the Teletubbies, that sort of embraces the machinery and I don't know the program, but when I was told that there was a character with a television in its stomach, I was horrified. Anything that makes people think that machines are more important than people. It's, uh, uh, although I have a feeling that that is not the purpose of that program. I don't think the purpose of that program is to say that machines are more important than people. I don't know, but I think it would be interesting to find out. For you, well, Gabby Hayes uh, would come in his uh, Western clothes and show old Western films. And he would just introduce them, and then at the end say, see you buckaroos or something, you know. The, what fascinated me was that, you know, he had his, his accent, and, uh, but when the program was over, he'd go to the dressing room on the nights that he had his tickets, he'd get into his formal clothes and go to the opera. He had a box at the opera. He loved the opera. You, often you don't know the depth of someone that you see only on television because that person who, like, like he was, playing a part, and here he is having a great love of classical music. The, uh, the hit parade, the... the uh, the voice of Firestone, 
Gabby Hayes, Kate Smith. I mean, Kate Smith was every day, every afternoon, uh, at the Hudson Theater. Uh, NBC owned the Hudson Theater. I don't know whether it's still there or not. Uh, uh, I think those are the only ones. The NBC Opera Theater became the, the most important one for me, because when, when I became the head floor manager of that, then I was on, in all of the production meetings. And the best part of that was hearing those operas over and over again. The ones that I floor managed, I mean, I know practically, uh, Billy Budd, for instance. I still sing parts of Billy Budd, King of the Sea. Th this was a Benjamin Britten opera. But you'll hear all that from Kirk. Yeah. I did not meet him. My, uh, my great uncle knew him quite well. And so whenever my great uncle would come to New York, he would stop in and see me, and then he would go and visit with Sarnoff. I'd like to have met Sarnoff because I, I like, is it, is it apocryphal, this story, that he received one of the messages from the Titanic? There'd been so much talk lately about the, the Titanic, you know, that I thought, isn't that interesting? This young teletype operator might have received one of the messages. And, and also, I think he had a tie with Nantucket, which is where we go every summer. Sarnoff, I mean, that, that was a business for him, you know. But he took it, I think he took the, I think he took it seriously that, that broadcasting could enhance the public in, in way, uh, I mean, those operas, uh, somebody sitting out in Kansas who had never been to New York, for instance, to see A Mall in the Night Visitors or Trouble in Tahiti or Peak Dom or any of the ones that we produced, that talk about enhancing culture. Television has such a great chance to do that and to teach foreign languages. You know, we, we have a, a character in the neighborhood, a new character that we've just introduced called the Hula Mouse, the royal Hula Mouse, and he lives in the castle with King Friday, and he speaks only Spanish. Well, the, the scripts are written in a way that the English that goes before and the English that comes after each one of his speeches, the Spanish is understood. I guess, you know, here we go back to Dartmouth and my love for Romance languages. And we have so many people writing to us saying, I came from Italy, I came from Israel, I came from uh, many different countries, and you helped me to learn English. You know, they would find someone who spoke slowly and de deliberately on the air, and invariably, if, if I'm going to talk about a cup, I'll have one in my hand, you know, and, and say cup, and, and, the, and the water's in it, you know. I, I didn't mean to do that, but I think it's a wonderful dividend of people from other nationalities learning our language through the neighborhood. I'm sure it crosses my mind at times, but I realize I'm not there to teach English. I'm there just to be myself. And so just continue being yourself, Fred. I think I met him the first day because I had a letter of recommendation to him. And I think he hired me. Now maybe he, you know, I worked on those color test programs. That's the other thing that I worked yeah, it's on. It's coming up. Yeah. Uh, I was the first floor manager in 3K, which had the only color uh, cameras 
in New York. There were three sets, three color sets that could receive these programs. Uh, General Sarnoff had one, and uh, Niles Trammell had the second, and I think maybe it was Pat Weaver who had the third. There were just three sets. And all we did in this studio was to move things from one place to another so that the cameras could take pictures of them. And I remember my first day on the job, somebody said, move the green parrot to the left. And I said, which one is the green one? I'm colorblind. And to have the first <laughs> floor manager for color television to be colorblind, I think is a kind of whimsical thing. <laughs> and so it didn't make all that much difference. You know, they just wanted to see pictures in their home of this new thing called color television. And uh, photographs, and, yeah, there, there were no, there was no production. It was just things that we would bring in and put on camera. And if they happened to be turning on their sets at home, why they'd just see something colorful. Parrots were colorful. In fact, it was the, you know, it was the RCA color that was chosen. Uh, there were competing uh, ones, and it was chosen to be the one that would go throughout the country. I liked some of those programs. You know, I was impressed with the musical programs that we did. There were still some that were, you know, there were I guess there'll always be pie-throwing programs but they don't need to be in the majority. Uh, yeah, I, th I thought television was doing, was doing good things. However, I didn't feel that I could use all the talents that had been given to me as a floor manager. Nevertheless, I think the floor manager position is an exceedingly important one. I mean, for instance, Gabby Hayes, again, said to me one day, do you realize that you're the only face that I see? Even though when I look in the, in the camera, I'm thinking of one person. The person that I'm closest to is you. He said, it makes such a difference if the floor manager seems interested in what you're doing. It's awful to have a floor manager, you know. <laughs> So that's a real art. Oh, well, you know, the, there are a lot of people in the operas, but uh, they were so concentrated on what... It, it's very different when something is a dramatic thing than when it is... when you're looking at the camera and, and you're feeling whether the people around you are enthusiastic about what you're doing. That makes a big difference. I have the most wonderful floor manager in the world, Nicky Tallow. You know, he has an advanced sense of humor. He and Jimmy Seach, and well, Michael uh, Douglas was here for quite a long time with us. He became, he went to Hollywood and became Michael Keaton. And, and those three on, on the, uh, set, we just had a ball. They were always playing jokes on me. One time they put shoes that were so small for me, I couldn't, at the end of the program, I couldn't get my feet in them. Uh, no, that's not true. They weren't small shoes. They, they were my shoes, but they, they had put uh, paper at the toe. And I kept putting them in, singing the last song, you know, such a good feeling to know you're alive, I'm trying to put that. But that was just for the rehearsal. It was such a great, uh, a great learning place for me. But some of the greatest things about it were the people that I worked with. And isn't that always the case? I mean, you can learn uh, the mechanics anywhere. 
but it's the relationships that, that develop. I mean, Kirk Browning, for instance, was uh, one of the ushers in our wedding. And when, when people work very close together to create something that they feel has value, that they want to give to, to their audiences, they become a community. And it's, it's a real blessing to be part of a community of givers. I mean, if, if, you, if your main focus happens to be the person who is going to be watching what you're producing, that to me is the greatest thing that you could ever have. And when people, I mean, it's so, so much more important than how many people are going to be watching. It's what if this person who is watching is somehow moved to do something of value because of what you've put on the air. That's so much more important than the numbers of millions of people who, who are tuned in. But it's all a matter of uh, quality versus quantity. And if we can only, if we can only not fall for the numbers game, we can continue to, uh, to have this medium be a, a, a really thoughtful one. Those are fairly hazy days. I, so much happened between those days at NBC and when I came here to Pittsburgh, that that, that was a, a phenomenal bridge. <laughs> I mean, when I heard that educational television, which is now called public television, when educational television was going to be starting in Pittsburgh, I mean, only 40 miles from where I grew up, I told some of my friends at NBC that I thought that I'd put my name in and apply for the station. They said, you are nuts. That place isn't even on the air yet. And you're in line to be a producer or a director or anything you want to be here. And I said, no, I have, I have the feeling that, uh, that educational television might, might be, at least for me, the way of the future. That was in 53. And I applied and was one of the first, I think one of the first six to be uh, hired at WQED, which, true, it wasn't on the air yet. We didn't go on the air until April 1st of 1954. But this was in 53, and Joanne and I moved to Pittsburgh in November of 53, and that's when I started at WQED. WQED was the first community-sponsored television station in the country. There were a few others that were linked with universities, but this was the very first that a whole community decided to underwrite. So Pittsburgh was at the forefront of, the, of community broadcasting. Uh, her name, was, she was the general manager, and her name was Dorothy Daniel. And we, we named Daniel Tiger for her. In fact, the night before we went on the air, the night before, no, that was, I've got to tell you about that. The first night on the air was a special program, and that was April 1st, 1954. People had been watching the test pattern for weeks before that, and it, but this was to be an hour special. We invited Frida Hennick who was the commissioner 
on the FCC to come and be part of the program. Because without Frida Hennig, there would have been no educational television. There would have been no PBS. There would have been no channels set aside for education throughout the country. She was adamant about there should be one free channel in every area. And it's thanks to Frida Hennig that PBS and educational television exist at any rate. Rita Hennig came and a very enthusiastic person. Talk about a good teacher. She, she was enthusiastic about what she had championed and well she might have been. We got on the air and showed little parts of what was to come and we sh Josie and I showed a part of the children's corner and somebody else showed a part of, uh, I think that we had a music program for, from Carnegie Tech, but lots of different excerpts. In other words, this is what you're going to see next week. Well, near the end of the program, Mrs. Daniels said, and now we have Frida Hennig, a commissioner from the FCC here to uh, help us tonight. Frida Hennig came on, started to talk about the vision of educational television, her passion. She went on and on and on. And finally, after she had talked, I think 40 minutes, Mrs. Daniel came in, you know, with the proverbial hook and said, it's just been wonderful having you here, Frida Hennig. And we thank you for all your help. But you see, here's somebody who really cared just enormously about what educational television could mean in this country. And I just love to think about that. At any rate, before we went on the air on April 5th, you see, April 1st was a Thursday. And then we went dark until Monday when regular programming would begin, and that was April 5th. Well, on the 4th, Mrs. Daniel gave us a party, all the people who were going to be on the air. And she gave favors at the party, and my favor was a little tiger puppet. And I said to Josie, our hostess, I said, why don't we just slit a, make a slit in the set, and I can poke this puppet through. Let's call it Daniel, and we'll just use it once. But, but what we did, the art department had, had painted this fanciful set, and there happened to be a clock on it. So I just put the little slit in the clock and poked Daniel and said, and went like that and pulled him away. Well, the people liked him so much, and she, of course, referred to him as Daniel, and that's how the puppetry began. We never expected to use puppets in the program. When I was a kid, I played with puppets, sure. And I had others in our attic. Uh, I mean, by then, our boys were, uh, no, our boys hadn't been born yet. Our boys were born in 59 and 61. So I must have had them from my childhood, but I would go home and uh, the puppets became popular. But there's a story behind every one of them. But Daniel was the first, and it was because of Dorothy Daniel that we called him Daniel Striped Tiger. Senator Pastore, this is a philosophical statement and would take about 10 minutes to read, so I'll not do that. Uh, one of the first things that a child learns in a healthy family is trust, and I trust what you have said that you will read this. It's very important to me. I care deeply about children. Okay. My first children's program was on WQED 15 years ago. 
and its budget was $30. Now, with the help of the Sears Roebuck Foundation and National Educational Television, as well as all of the affiliated stations, each station pays to show our program. It's a unique kind of funding in educational television. With this help, now our program has a budget of $6,000. It may sound like quite a difference, but $6,000 pays for less than two minutes of cartoons, two minutes of animated, what I sometimes say, bombardment. I'm very much concerned, as I know you are, about what's being delivered to our children in this country. And I've worked in the field of child development for six years now, trying to understand the inner needs of children. We deal with such things as, as the inner drama of childhood. We don't have to bop somebody over the head to make him, to, to make drama on the screen. We deal with such things as getting a haircut or the feelings about brothers and sisters and the kind of anger that arises in simple family situations and we speak to it constructively. How long a program is it? It's a I'm half hour every day. Most channels schedule it in the, in the noontime as well as in the evening. Uh, WETA here has scheduled it in the late afternoon. Could we get a copy of this so that we can see it? Maybe not today, but I'd like to see the program. I'd like very much for you I'd to like see I'd like to see the program itself or any one of them, you see. We, we made 100 programs for EEN, the Eastern Educational Network, and then when the money ran out, people in Boston and Pittsburgh and Chicago all came to the fore and said, we've got to have more of this neighborhood expression of care. And this is what, this is what I give. I give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique. I end the program by saying, you've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service for mental health. Uh, I think that it's much more dramatic that two men could be working out their feelings of anger, much more dramatic than showing something of gunfire. I'm constantly concerned about what our children are seeing. And for 15 years, I have tried in this country and Canada to present what I feel is a meaningful expression of care. Do you narrate it? I'm the host, yes. And I do all the puppets, and I write all the music, and I write all the scripts. Well, I'm supposed to be a pretty tough guy, and this is the first time I've had goosebumps for the last two days. <laughs> well, I'm grateful not only for your goosebumps, but for your interest in, in our kind of communication. Could I tell you the words of one of the songs which I feel is very important? Yes. This has to do with that good feeling of control, which I feel that the children need to know is there. And it starts out, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And that first line came straight from a child. I work with children do, doing puppets in, in very personal communication with small groups. What do you do with the mad that you feel? When you feel so mad, you could bite when the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right. What do you do? Do you punch a bag? Do you pound some clay or some dough? Do you round up friends for a game of tag or see how fast you go? It's great to be able to stop when you've planned a thing that's wrong and be able to do something else instead. 
and think this song. I can stop when I want to, can stop when I wish, can stop, 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 any time. And what a good feeling to feel like this and know that the feeling is really mine. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. I don't know exactly how it came about. I don't think I ever really did care much for meat. But uh, from the time that my father died, I haven't had meat in my diet. And that was in 1970. And then a few years ago, I gave up seafood. And that was simply because I said to somebody, I had heard that fish was very good for you. And that person said, yeah, but it's not good for the fish. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. And of course we have fish on the, on the neighborhood set that we take care of too. But that's just something that I feel better about and it's not something that I'm a proselytizer for. Uh, I know a lot of uh, very fine people who have a great variety of diets. Food is a very important thing to people who uh, are interested in, in nourishment, the nourishment of life. And the very first view that we have of our whole world is that view of our mother's face during our nursing. And so we get our, our very first impressions of what this world is like through our mouth and our eyes. And if what's good is coming into our mouth and what's good is coming into our eyes, we have a mighty strong beginning. And my name is Fred McFeely Rogers, the middle part of which is speedy delivery. <laughs> if we had a thing in our family called the book house and it was maybe 15 volumes uh, beginning with very early uh, nursery rhymes and fairy tales and going up with lots and lots of different stories. But I remember the book house as being important to me. And uh, there, was, there was one story in there about uh, a woman who was in bed and, and heard this noise. I wish I could do that. I wish I knew you were going to ask me about that. I, I would have looked that up. That teeny tiny, yeah, there was a teeny tiny woman in a teeny tiny house with a teeny tiny, and it went on like that, you know. And then at the end there was this big loud noise and that was the way it ended. That always just delighted me, you know, with a very tiny voice and my, and my parents would read it that way. And then at the end, I remember the last word was, are, are you ready, Radar? But that was very important to, to have, have people read to me. And I remember how important it was to our boys. They'd always want to be read to, especially Jay. And now he just devours books. I'm convinced that if a child is read to by a loved one early on, that that child will somehow recreate that scene himself or herself by reading. And, and when you're an adult, you might not have that person right there, but you have the memory of that person right there as you're doing the reading. That's the most important help in helping children to learn to read is to read to them with affection. And I went to all public schools and I, I'm very glad that I was able to go through the whole school system of La Trobe uh, through high school. I remember that's when I started to write for the newspaper. 
I had a column in the Latrobe Bulletin as well as the school newspaper. And that really gave me a lot of practice. I, I thought of that fondly when, uh, when the newspaper column came up in the last two years. You know, we've been writing a column for King Features. And uh, those things have deep roots. I guess that's, you know, I must be an emotional archaeologist because I keep looking for the roots of, of things particularly the roots of behavior and why I feel certain ways about certain things. I wrote about everything that had to do with, with life in La Trobe High School because th that was my biggest extracurricular activity. I was also editor of the yearbook my senior year and president of the student council in my senior year at high school. Very different from my freshman year in high school. I was a very shy kid. I was the Daniel Striped Tiger of that school, I'm sure. But uh, something happened and, and you can never truly, completely understand why. But there was this kid who was in our church whose name was Jim Stumbaugh. And he, he was a revered member of the, of the class in high school. He was a basketball player, a football player. He had, was getting a letter in track. And, I mean, he was very gifted in, not only in sports, but scholastically. He was, you know, a class hero. Well, he got hurt in a football game. And somebody suggested that I take his homework to him at the hospital. I said, me? Oh, years later, we talked about it, and he said, I couldn't believe it was you walking in that room. Well, I took it. What's he reading? Oh, a wrinkle in time. That's good stuff, Hisher. Yeah. Well, it was like this. I, I went to a camp one time because there was a ventriloquist there and I was interested in that kind of stuff. I mean, I was interested in puppets, you know, all my young life. But <laughs> there's, there's one woman over at, uh, at the office who is really scared of Hisher. They, they put him in at her uh, desk one day, when, and when she came in, he was looking at it. Because there were those who, who treated me well, and there were those who treated me like, how can I say that? There were those who treated me like a servant. And when I would bring something to them that they liked, they never acknowledged it. And if I would bring something to them with, without the cream that was supposed to be in it, then I was told. And I remember that as a as a very fine experience in my life because I know how I felt when, when somebody treated me with disdain because of the job that I had. I was, I was no less a person than I ever was, but being in that position, there were those people who felt that they could treat me as somebody less I know how it feels to be turned down. And when you can be in the position of turning up somebody at a time like that, I think it's a, I think it's a real addition. And there were only three people in New York City who could receive the color broadcasts that we did from a studio called 3K.
So we would go in and it was just sort of like play. Well, I was the first floor manager for those color experimental programs and I'm colorblind. And everybody thought that that was such an irony that because the, the director would say, move the green parrot over to the left. Well, there were two parrots there and I, I'd say to one of the stagehands, one's green and so then we'd ha have it moved but he said buddy you're gonna be fine they had had some people who had come to them and were so dictatorial that they could make or break them and often they did because these stagehands had been there for years doing concerts and all kinds of things but you know you learn a lot of good lessons in life and they're mostly about human relations. The other things don't matter that much. I would, I would just say that I'm, I'm a man who talks with children on television and helps them to feel as good as possible about themselves and about the people that they meet. <laughs> it's a very, very personal medium, as you may know, it, and it's received by everyone differently because each person brings his or her own story to that program that's on that particular moment. Well, I suppose it's an invitation. Won't you be my neighbor? Uh, it's an invitation for uh, somebody to be close to you, because that's what neighbors are. They happen to be in the same neighborhood and, and close. And it, I think it's a parable for the, uh, the desire for closeness and if you can be close, why then, and if you can care about me, then maybe there are things that you'll want to learn that I have to give you. Your teachers are very, very important in a child's life. Well, in anybody's life. You know, I think about, about uh, Jesus being called a teacher. Rabboni means teacher. And uh, it's such a lofty profession. Could be, should be, is that of teacher. Without their students, teachers would not be teachers. Without kids who want to watch the neighborhood, I would not be a television artist. Without Jay and John, I would not be a father. Without certain, well, without a friend, I would not be a friend. All of the relationships in life that are so enhancing to who we are. You know, I think everybody longs to be loved and longs to know that he or she is lovable. And consequently, the greatest thing that we can do is to help somebody know that they're loved and capable of loving. You've made this day a special day, you see? by just your being you. And if a person can receive that, of course it's an enhancement to them. But think of what an enhancement it is to the, to the giver. It helps to be loved in order to work in this life. In fact, I'm sad for those who don't feel that they are loved. 
And this book is a compilation of things that I've said in speeches and in other books and in newspaper columns and on the neighborhood for a long time. Somebody said, how long did it take you to write this book? And I said, 40 years. It's about uh, being. Uh, it's about the things that matter to me. Yeah. It's about the white spaces between the paragraphs, which I think are more important than any of the text, yeah. because it allows you to think about what's just been said. I had a professor one time, I think he's on page 20 or, right. or 22. Uh, his, his name was Dr. William Orr. Right. And he said, you know, Fred, there's one thing that evil cannot stand, and that is forgiveness. And you notice the rest of the page is blank. Yes. It needs a lot of time to think about that. Oh, a lot of people. But a lot of people who have allowed me to have some silence. And I don't think we give that gift very much anymore. I'm very concerned that our society is much more interested in information than wonder, in noise rather than silence. How do we do that? I mean, in our business, yours and mine, how do we encourage reflection? I trust that this book will do some of that, but oh my, this is a noisy world. And knowing that you're unique, you know that there, when you think about it, there has never been another Charlie Rose in all of the history of humankind, and there never will be. And that's the same with every person you meet, mm. probably because of very early on in our lives that we weren't valued. You know, the greatest gift we can give anybody, any little child, is to help that child know that, hey, you know, you're a part of our family, and you're, you're a welcome part and there are things that you can do to enhance our family. Yeah. Oh, I hope that it's given a few more honest adults in the lives of the children who watch, because I do think that that's a great gift, that if, if adults can show what they love in front of kids, there'll be some child who'll say, I'd like to be like that. Or I'd like to do that. I remember Yo-Yo Ma being on our program. He, he's come to visit several times. Yeah. And there have been families who have written to us to say that their kids want to learn the cello. Right. Because they saw him love his work on the program. Uh. And there have been some basketball players and some sculptors. Oh, I remember it in the nursery school where I worked as I was doing my my master's work in child development. There was a man who would come every week to sculpt in front of the kids. The director said, I don't want you to teach sculpting. I just want you to do what you do and love it in front of the children. During that year, clay was never used more imaginatively before or after than during that time that he came. Mm. So a great gift of any adult to a child, it seems to me, is to love what you do in front of the child. I mean, if, if, you, love to, yeah. if you love to bicycle, if you love to repair things, do that in front of the children. Let them, let them catch the attitude that that's fun. Because you know attitudes are caught, they're not yeah. taught. 